We don't see points on the map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem. Lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard-to-reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief. And we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. Local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. Well, we are glad to welcome you this morning to Eastside Baptist Church. And it's a great day, and boy, wasn't that great when the choir sang, Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. That was great. <laughs> Scaled them back a few, and uh, we're so glad you're here today. This is a, a time of year where we focus on our, our emphasis on the incarnation of Christ and the re video reminder about our, our need to support our missionaries was such a great encouragement. And so we're thankful that you're here today, and if you're a guest, uh, there's something for you at the Welcome Center, and you can get that on your way out, but we say welcome to you. Uh, my name is Joe Butler. I'm the interim who's been here a few weeks now, and appreciate the opportunity to come back to, um, as they say in, in Jackson County, May Randall. Um, Brother David, Dr. David, you doctor yet? Almost. Dr. David Beagle is your new pastor. He'll be here in a couple of weeks. He wanted to come and just get on the runway and get warmed up. Family's homesick still. Pray for them. They're itching to get here, and they'll be here soon. But we're glad you're here, and glad David's here today. So good. We're in that time of year where we focus on the birth of Christ, and there's so many things to look at today about that. Uh, Lottie Moon is an opportunity to give to international missions, and uh, there's so many other things going on during this month that it'll be a great time together. Uh, Wednesdays are always great. Bill will fill you in on some of that as we... Uh, finish up our service today, but we're glad and thankful that God's brought you out to worship with us today. Let's join our hearts in prayer, and then we'll continue with our singing. Father, thank you today that we have been able to come into your presence and to declare that Jesus is our Lord. We thank you so much that he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. We thank you for the life he lived, the death he died, and the fact that he is now living and lives forever. We thank you that he is King of Kings. Today, Father, we, we pray that you'd help us to, to realize what is important, primary, significant in this time, not to be distracted by all the things that happened during this season. May we today worship the risen Lord, and may we celebrate the fact that he came as a helpless baby so many years ago. We pray, Father, today you speak to every need. We know there are folks here, here today who have needs that they haven't even expressed to anyone else. And some today, Father, that needs a touch for what you can do and a, con a convincing that your word is true and what you said really matters. We pray, Father, today that you be glorified. We pray that your people would worship you. We celebrate, we welcome you, we come before you, and we adore you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together. We're going to join our voice in praise as we sing unto the Lord today.
Let's sing. today. Amen. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to join together as we sing some songs of the season. Hark the herald angels sing and the first Noel. Let's stand again as we sing. Let's sing. Yeah. 
Father, truly today we rejoice in our Savior's birth. Lord, I thank you for what it means that he came to this earth to live a sinless life that we might have eternal life. And Father, I just pray that in some way that we would really experience the true meaning of Christmas this year. That we've looked past all the commercialism, all the hype. And Father, that we truly see what Christmas is. And that the true reason for Christmas is Jesus. Father, it's the same Jesus that can change our lives, that can, can make us new creatures. Father, no matter what we've done, there's no sin too difficult that you can't forgive. And Father, I just praise you for the gift of salvation. And Lord, I pray if there's somebody here that has not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. And Father, may everything we do here bring honor and glory to that precious name of Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We have a special treat today. Uh, this is Sarah Matthews. She's a student at Baptist College, music major. And some of you might remember her as being the drummer for the jazz band. Well, uh, recently we found out this girl can sing. So, not only can she play the drums, but she can sing. So, uh, I've invited her to come and share a special song with us today. And I know your heart will be blessed as she shares with you this song.
Amen. I don't know how Ron found out she could sing when um, she just played the drums. You know, I've noticed something, Ron. I've only seen ladies playing the drums since I've been here. And I saw her today, and I thought, that's a different lady, but they kind of favor. You know, it wasn't since back in our days, you know, we thought Ringo could just play the, the drums. He never knew he could sing either, but that was great today. And we're glad your pastor's here and, and uh, new pastor's here and look forward to him coming and uh, getting more into the uh, swing of things. We do have a special guest today that we want to recognize, and uh, it's Miss Corrine Wimberly, and she's celebrating her 99th birthday. And, and she's standing up. She's standing up. So that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Is there anybody in here older than that? <laughs> Just want to make sure, but we give you honor today. And this is a great place to be on your birthday. Get all these people to come and celebrate with you. And uh, any number of them will take you out to lunch today if you, if you wait around. So y'all line up if you want to take her out to lunch today, okay? Great. In your Bibles today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. And Matthew chapter 2. So we'll be in two places today. We're looking at a variety of uh, passages that are usually used at the Christmas time. And um, some time ago, I was thinking about how um, all these things happen. And sometimes people say, Why did that happen in that way? Why did it happen in that way? But I want to show you today how Satan fools people at Christmas time. I think this is one of the most deceptive times of the year because people oftentimes are led into other areas that had nothing to do with what this is about. And you've seen it through the years. You know it. Um, people have talked about it and prayed things along that line today that we not be caught off guard by all the commercialism that goes along with Christmas. But I want you to focus on this morning what Satan did and what he's still doing to fool people, to deceive people at this time of the year. Now we're going to start off in Luke chapter 2 this morning. And I want you to look at me, with me at the story, beginning with verse 1, where it says that a decree came about from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. I'm reading from the New American Standard. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Here's the key, because there was no room for them in the inn. So in this little town of Bethlehem, there was an inn, and there was a place where they could have gone, but because of the census, it was possibly filled up, and so there was no place for them. So they went out to uh, the place where the cattle were stored, the livestock were stored, and there in a stable, she gave birth to the Lord Jesus. Christmas has captured so much of our attention through the years. I know people say, this is my favorite time of the year. And more than any of the other holidays or any other seasons, they love what happens at Christmas. There's so many things that go into it. Matter of fact, you and I have noticed several years ago that when Labor Day weekend hits, usually you start seeing Christmas decorations out in the stores and things are, are out there. Uh, you start seeing live trees out before Thanksgiving and you start seeing Christmas specials. Black Friday began on November 1st this year, and all that goes into it is a great, great uh, adventure in trying to get us to focus on the season. The lights, the decoration, the pageantry, all the songs, all the things that go on remind us of how important it is in the eyes of the world. Even in those who do not recognize Jesus as the Christ or as the true Messiah. And so the, the, the money that's spent, the food, the parties, uh, the, the things that are given, the gifts, all of these things become important to so many folks uh, to take off time and take trips and go see family, visit relatives and friends. But we have to remember, 
just like the scripture said that Jesus was that gift and we focus on that the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord Romans 6 23 we miss sometimes the fact that we're into the gifts and the giving and not the gift of what it was all about when this happened it was nobody's idea that it would become such a great commercial venture and such a great season of the year it was done so quietly and so so uh so silently that uh, when christ came into the world he came in to save us from our sins and it wasn't broadcast on all the news networks like it would be today and so it happened and no one knew about it not until jesus began to make himself publicly known was baptized by john the people began to see something was happening so just as people were fooled in that day people are fooled today by all the things that happened in this christmas time I want to look at several of the characters that Matthew 2 and Luke 2 show to us and help us to understand how Satan fools people at Christmas. I read to you the first part of the story in Luke chapter 2, and when it came to the end of it, it's almost as if Luke gave a, gave a side note. She had him there because there wasn't any room anywhere else. The end was full. And it, because the end was full, he had to be born in an obscure place um, it probably was not a big deal to them. Uh, but to us, it would be, okay, we can't put you in the hospital, but you can go out into the lean-to behind the building here and have your baby. And that's about what happened. So Jesus was born in obscurity in an obscure little village in a place that no one thought about and recognized as being a very important thing. So the, the one that ran the inn was probably pretty busy because the census was going on. People were coming in from all over the place. So the innkeeper was so busy, he was so preoccupied with all the things happening that he was fooled and did not see something great was happening. Now, we give him, we give him excuses. We, we give him leeway to say, well, he didn't really know what was going on. But how many today are so busy with everything they're doing, preoccupied with all the happenings, that they miss what God is up to and don't see what he is about? Because of their ignorance, because of their preoccupation with things that are temporary and mundane, they're more about savings than they are about the Savior. They're more into the money than they are about the Messiah. And whether we have a tree or lights or anything else really doesn't matter. You say, well, that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. Yeah, that's what they do. And it doesn't mean that they're right. It doesn't mean they're wrong. But we have focused on the things that don't really make Christmas Christmas the things we use are symbols and are, are ways to remind us of things so we're trying to figure out what do we want like I should tell you you know I get that Sears Roebuck catalog out when I was young they don't even make those anymore if you've got one left over hang on to it you might be able to sell it one day on the eBay for hundred dollars or something and I would make my list and put it there on daddy's breakfast place in the mornings and let you know I picked out everything I want that's what I was concerned about and there's some folks that focus on where they're going to go, how can they get the cheapest thing, how can they make the best uh, travel plans, uh, you know, where, where can you get the best airfare. What, what are we looking for? We're looking for everything that will make it a wonderful, meaningful time for our events to take place. The meaningless and mundane crowd out adoring Christ. So are you so preoccupied and busy that you've been fooled by Satan? But there's another person I want to focus on. Go to Luke chap or Matthew chapter 2, and notice there's another fellow who was very important on the scene, and his name was King Herod. This second fellow here um, was one, when he heard about the birth of Jesus, it was through the wise men who had come in a little bit later, so it had not just recently happened. It had been several weeks, maybe even months before they got there, and they came to Jerusalem, not to Bethlehem, because the star was in the general vicinity. And they figured, well, if a king is born, he's surely going to be born in the capital city. We'll go to Jerusalem. And so they came to Jerusalem, and they came to Herod, and they wanted to know where this child that was born. Uh, verse 2 says, who's been born king of the Jews. Well, that got Herod's attention because he was the king of the Jews. He thought he was in charge. And so he was, he was jealous and he was full of fear, later full of rage and full of taking action on those unborn babies. And Herod, King Herod, 
was so caught up in his own life because he wasn't a Jew, but he thought that he had a, a way with the Jews. He thought he had an understanding with the Jews. And uh, he was picked by the Romans. He was appointed, but he was a, like all the Herods, he was a political madman. Not unlike some of what we have in Washington today. And so you have him uh, fearing his position is going to be taken. What, do you, what would you think if you had three, not we say three, you had an entourage of magi, wise men from the east come in. With, and it wasn't just three guys on camels and a horse. This was probably a party of folks decked out with their gifts that they were going to give to this Messiah, this king. And they pulled in, and everybody in Jerusalem noticed. They went to where Herod was in the palace, and King Herod heard them say, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? They didn't like that. Herod didn't like that. So he caught their attention. And people today are more fascinated with Jesus, but they do not consecrate themselves to him. Herod was fascinated with the Jews and the ways of the Jews, but he was not consecrated to the one who was going to save people from their sins. Herod was not going to save people from their sins. And chapter 1 of Matthew tells us when the angel spoke to Joseph, he will save his people from their sin. That's what he was going to do. He was a savior who was coming, who would be king. So there you have Herod full of rage, fear, jealousy, wondering what was going to take place. More into what it's about me, not about him. So he played the game. Oh, when you find him, let me know because I want to come worship him. And some people say whatever they need to say to get what they want because they want it to be about themselves and not about Jesus. And so what are we doing this time of the Christmas uh, season is to be reminded that it is not about us, it is about him. But like Herod, he was wondering about who this person was going to take his place, bump him out, move him along there's a third group we see here in uh, chapter 2 of Matthew and that is the chief priests and the scribes when they come in and, and uh, talk to um, Herod he wants to know something so we see it in verse 4 he gathered together all the chief priests and scribes of the people and began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born hey guys you know the theology you studied the scriptures you know the old uh the the, the writings of, of the scripture where, where is this messiah going to be born didn't bat an eye they didn't say well let's get our concordance out and see but i said well in the book of micah it says he's going to be born in a little obscure village called bethlehem they knew it they knew the scriptures they knew that they knew the bible uh they they didn't say Micah 5 2 because there wasn't 5 and 2 back then they said the prophet Micah spoke of this he would be born in Bethlehem a very little place a very obscure place and they were so filled with their own pride and their own sense of importance but their indifference and a lot of folks during the Christmas season find themselves uh, being deceived by Satan fooled by him because they too don't need a Messiah these guys thought they knew everything. Why would I need a Messiah? And they were filled with their own sense of importance. They were indifferent to even go and walk the distance out to Bethlehem from Jerusalem to see if anything was going on there. They knew the truth, but they ignored the truth. Oh, do folks come to church on Sunday and hear the truth but ignore it? Oh, yeah. Our folks on Sundays coming and uh, listening to the singing and, and, and thinking it's wonderful and hearing the preaching and hoping it'll get over with pretty quick and then walk out and say, I don't have any intention of obeying God. They do. So Satan fools people even to this day. The apathy that was in their life was overwhelming. And people today are fooled by Satan because they will not admit they need a savior. They will not admit that he, he is the Messiah. They will not admit that he is God come in the flesh to save men from their sins. They were not taken with any of this. They ignore the remedy because they have not even recognized they have a disease. Well, there's another group of people here we see in Matthew chapter 2, and then we'll see uh, over in Luke 2, the people of Jerusalem. In verse 3, it says, when Herod heard the king, Herod the king heard it, he was troubled. 
And notice this, Matthew says, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, sometimes when a national leader gets troubled, we may get troubled, especially if we think he's a little bit unhinged. And um, so Herod gets troubled, and guess what? Everybody's concerned. What's he going to do? What he did was shocking. What's, how's he going to resolve this? What's he going to do to take action on this? So here, here Herod was uh, uh, doing these things, and the people of Jerusalem were following up on that, and yet there were a few that heard the truth, like the shepherds. In Luke chapter 2, the shepherds were out in the field, minding their own business, minding their flocks at night. And the word came to them first. We talked about that Wednesday night. We talked about Hark the Herald, angels sing. He didn't go to the palace. He didn't go to Rome or Athens. He didn't go to the, the high up Roman. He went to the shepherds and said, glory to God in the highest. Peace has now come to men on earth. It's here. And you can go in and find him. He'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes. He'll be laying in a manger. They found him. There he was. But Jerusalem was filled not only with uh, some shepherds, but Simeon and Anna in the last part of chapter 2 heard uh, God speak to them and they had lived a long life waiting to see the consolation of Israel. And both of them in the last part of chapter 2 met Jesus and had some words to say as they saw him. Shepherds and Anna obviously told others about this. But the people of Jerusalem were caught up in their religious ritual. They were doing what the Jews said to do. They were taking their, their sacrifices and their offerings to the temple. They, were, they thought, well, the Romans rule us. We're still going to worship. So they were going through the motions of doing what they knew was right. I know Brother David's probably heard this, but there are a lot of folks through the years, you, you, you share with them, you witness to them, and you know what they say? Well, my mama and daddy were church-going people, and I've got an uncle that was a preacher and my grandfather was a deacon. And he knew the Bible from cover to cover. What in the world does that mean to you? Why, do you? why are you telling me that? And some have said, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. Well, why do you ignore it, ignore it when you know it? And so the people of Jerusalem were caught up as long as we do our ritual. I go to church, I go to mass, I go to uh, communion, I go to confession, I go to whatever I go to. It's not a seasonal feeling that makes the difference, but serious, continual faith. God's not looking for you to get all worked up and happy about Christmas. And, um, you know, there's a standing joke that preachers used to tell. David may not be young. He may not be old enough to heard this, but on Christmas Day, and Christmas Day is be on Sunday this year, we would say, um, uh, he is risen or happy Easter. You say, why would you say that? Because you won't see him till Easter. And then at Easter, you'd get up and say, Merry Christmas, because you wouldn't see him till Christmas. They will keep the rituals, keep the, keep the ball rolling, keep the, the, the activities going on in that way. And they're caught up in doing the things that uh, seem to fit their religious lifestyle, even if it is a false uh, religion or if it is a true religion, but it's misdirected. Sometimes we say, oh, he's at the Baptist church. Oh, we think that's safe because he's at the Baptist church. And then you mention he's at another church. Somebody, oh, I, so and so, he goes to another church. You think, oh, goodness, he may not be saved. Don't assume because you go to a Baptist church you're saved. So don't get caught up in the religion and the ritual and miss the fact of who he is. He's not after your admiration. He's after your adoration. Oh, come let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. And then there's another one here we need to notice. The Romans. They ruled the world. They were the ones who had control of everything. And we go to Luke chapter 3 and notice something here in Luke chapter 3. We notice that they were um, in charge of everything. And Luke even records this for us in chapter 3. He says this. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias and was tetrarch of Abilene. Isn't it interesting how they list, Luke lists everybody who's in charge. 
And year that this guy was president, this guy was senator, this guy was governor, he gets down to the end of it. And you say, why is he telling us all of that? Because the Romans were into who's in charge. They were into power. The Romans were into worshiping their own gods, their own idolatrous lifestyle. That's all that they were concerned about. And they were, they were looking at all these things. And they thought Caesar was in charge. They thought Herod was in charge. Pilate was running things. All of these folks were important people to them. But you come down in, cha- in chapter 3 of Luke and you notice something else. When you look at the Romans and all of this, then Luke goes on and tells us this. It's very interesting here. He says um, in verse 2, he mentions the Annas, the high Caiaphas, the high priest. He says, the word of the Lord came to John. Now, who was John? Cousin of Jesus. Mother was Elizabeth and Zacharias. He grew up to be the forerunner, the witness to those. John the witness, John the baptizer. He was the one who was to tell everyone about Jesus. And he was so obscure, he didn't go out and set up his, his, his thing on the busy highway in the populated areas. He went into the wilderness, that's what it says there. He was uh, out in the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was in the wilderness, verse 2 says, the last part of it. He went out in the middle of nowhere where nobody was and he started preaching and men started coming to him and wanting him to tell them the truth. He told them and they repented and they, he said, bring forth your fruits of repentance. You know, he called them, he called them whitewashed walls and vipers and things. Wouldn't it be great if, if you, all you heard when you came to church was, how terrible you were. Well, John was pretty well laying it on. And so they heard all of that. And so as they look at this, you'll notice the Romans were caught up in this idolatry and the word, but the word of the Lord didn't come to Caesar or Pilate or Herod. It came to John. The Romans missed the true God here and their idolatrous ways and their idolatrous worship of a, the wrong God in the wrong way uh, caused them to, to have so many other things in their life that were more important than the true Jesus. You know, so many folks will stop and, and think about who Jesus is at this time of the year and never know who he really is because they miss and are deceived by what they see, just like the Romans. But there's one other group here I'll show you this, this morning. That is the people of Nazareth. When you go over in Luke, you'll look at chapter 4, and notice that Jesus has now been baptized and gone through the temptation, and he's gone back to Nazareth. He was, he was um, raised in Nazareth after spending some time in Egypt and came back. He was born in Bethlehem, right? it was spent some time in, in Egypt and came to Nazareth, was raised. Uh, obviously, Joseph is no longer around. He's probably died. Mary's there, and uh, his, some of his siblings are there. Jesus was not the one and only, like some uh, folks may tell you in, in other uh, churches, but he had brothers and sisters, and he comes back home, and he's going to preach, and he's going to share something, and they don't know what it is. He comes into the synagogue, the scripture tells us, down in verse 16, and uh, he began to uh, pick up the scriptures, as was his habit, and uh, he came, and he stood up, and he's going to read it. It was his turn to read, evidently. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and that was okay because that's what the Messiah was going to do they were excited about hearing that reminder of what he would do then he goes on closes the book gave it back to the attendant sat down and they all fixed their eyes on him and he says in verse 21 today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing what what do you mean we know who you are we saw you as a little boy we saw you working with Joseph out there building tables and repairing things in people's homes we know who you are don't tell us that this scripture this is blasphemous how dare you say that so there the people of nazareth were just as troubled as the people of jerusalem because they were caught up in their own familiarity and 
blindness over who Jesus was. You know, you grew up in church and become so familiar with Jesus and not know him. Thought about that? My wife and I will talk about um, different individuals that we've known through the years and, and how they've been exposed to the gospel and exposed to the truth and yet seem to be so far away from it. I said, you know, it's like, it's like 2 Corinthians 4. The God of this world has blinded their eyes from the glorious light of the gospel. God will come and, and reveal himself, and he has revealed himself in Jesus. The most specific way he's revealed himself is in the person of Jesus, and he has done this, and Jesus stood up and said, this scripture today is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow, this is great. We know that you're now the Messiah. We wondered all through the years who you were. We thought you were special, not just because your mama said it all the time, but wow, isn't it great that you are a hometown boy from here in Nazareth and you can put your name out on the, on the wall with all the other famous people from Nazareth? And remember what Nathaniel said when he heard Jesus was around? Oh, he's from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? No, that's not what they did. They didn't say, let's have a special day. We'll have, we'll have Jesus of Nazareth day. We're going to celebrate the fact that you are now the Messiah. No, look at what they did. The scripture goes on down in verse 28 and, um, of chapter 4 of Luke. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. They were not indifferent. They were filled with rage. Can you believe he said that? We're right here in the synagogue, and he's saying that. And then he goes on and says this. And they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. They were going to kill him. He did not want to put up with this. And there are many people who, when Jesus gets serious about who he is and they're confronted with it and they can't ignore it, you know what they do? They get filled with rage because they're so familiar with him. How dare he try to be something other than what I want him to be? And he says, I am the Messiah. And it says in verse 30, the passing through the midst, he went away. That's one of those strange scenes I would like to see. And here they are about to throw him over the cliff, and Jesus just walks through them and gets, gets away from them. They did not like it. And later on, you'll see, they didn't like when he came back. They never liked when he came back. His, his family, his mom and his brother and sisters had tried to have an intervention. We've got to do something about him. He's a little bit up here. And it didn't work. It didn't happen. The people did not understand. They said, how can this be? Same way today. People grow up. They go to Awana. They go to Sunday school. They go to Sunday morning, Sunday night. They can quote scriptures. I've met so many folks in the jail through the years who can quote me scriptures they have learned from their youth. I used to go to a jail in Hardy County with a guy who a um, little bit, just two or three years older than me, and Kenny would tell me, he said, um, these guys would come in, and Kenny would look at them, they'd be all tattooed up and everything. He'd say, I had you when you were eight years old in Awana. Yeah, Mr. Kenny. And they're like 28, 30 now. And they'd be, get excited. They'd start saying, I, I know the Bible. I, I know the scriptures. And folks can grow up in all these things. They've heard it so much. It means nothing to them. Now, here's what I want to ask you. If you think about these folks that are fooled by, by the devil, fooled by Satan, deceived by him, ask yourself this question. Am I being fooled? Has he deceived me? Am I so concerned about getting everything right this time of the year that I missed what it's really all about? You know, the Scripture tells us, and I pointed this out a couple of weeks ago. John 1, verse 11 says, He came to his own, and his own received him not. How in the world could that be? He came to Israel. Israel said, we don't know you. The people of Nazareth, we, you, you, what are you saying here? But verse 12 of John 1 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the authority, the right, the privilege to become sons of God, children of God, even to those that believe on his name. Now, where are you? Have you come to that place where you have 
seen him and yet you don't recognize him like Israel did? Or have you said, I'm ready to receive him and believe him that he would be the Lord in my life? Make me a child of God. I've been created by God. Make me a child of God. You know, all of us are in the family of mankind, but not all of us are in the family of God. You may be a creation of God, but have you become a child of God? It happens when you receive him and when you believe him, and that happens by faith alone in Christ alone. What are you trusting in today? Pray with me this morning. Father, I ask you today that you would do a work of searching our hearts and help us to come to that place where we recognize who you really are. I pray that you would cause us to see that it doesn't matter what we have dreamed up or heard or thought in our own minds about who you are. But I pray that we recognize that your word has given us a clear picture of who you are. And I pray that we would see that more than anything else. We pray this invitation time would be a time where we trust you and you alone. And Father, I ask you that those today who have ignored you, neglected you, or who have been in flat-out rebellion toward you today would give up and give in and say, yes, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus came to save men from their sins. I need my life changed and transformed. I believe he died and rose again for me. And when they would call upon the Lord Jesus to save them today. So, Father, have your way during this time. We pray that you would do the work you came to do. We pray that you would help us today to respond to you in faith. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. God speaking. We sing. God calls. You come right now. Just as As we say each and every Sunday, the invitation is not in just because the music is over. The invitation here is ongoing. If you need to speak with someone or talk with someone, our new pastor is here. Well, Joe is here. I'm here. Eli's here. Ron's here. We would love to talk with you and uh, share with you how you too can know who Christ is. Just a few real quick announcements to make. First of all, don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock is our ladies cookie swap and our men's tailgate party. We're going to have a good time of fellowship as we enter the Christmas season. Don't forget to bring ladies, bring uh, cookies and uh, finger food. And men, we just get to bring a finger food and eat. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to swap cookies. We're going to just eat. We're going to be out front. The men are going to be out front. The ladies are going to be in the dining hall. And we're just going to have a good time just as we enter the Christmas season. And also, don't forget our uh, December 7th is our uh, quarterly business meeting. The budgets are uh, out front on the offering table there. If you would pick one of those up in uh, the 13th. Our Joy Club, just older youth, are going to meet. And then the, uh, Wednesday, the 14th, we're going to have our chili and caroling time. We just get together and have a good time going to different places in Marianne and singing Christmas carols and sharing God's love with people. And also, don't forget, it was mentioned earlier this morning, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. All of that money goes to support our missionaries. And we have two that are very special to us here, Jeffrey and Sydney, And they, 
got a message from them on our Facebook page. They are now back safe in their country that they came from. So be in prayer for them, and also don't forget that we can support them also. All right? Brother Ron, we're going to sing? Yeah, let's sing Amazing right. Grace.